One of my joys of uh, Life Group is that we get to talk about these things more than just um, the sermon on Sunday. Um, this is a case where uh, this last week we were meeting in Life Group. We were talking about last week's message. We were talking about what it means to be children of God, what that looks like. And um, we talked about how last week's text really set the stage for how does one become a child of God. And it was pointed out in our Life Group that this week's text really shows the marks of what does it look like. How does being a child of God appear? How can one look and see somebody's a child of God. And this is, uh, is, gets to the core of um, something we often think about when we think of who we are. Uh, if anyone's seen the movie Batman Begins, the original of the Christopher Nolan trilogy, uh, there's this part where Bruce Wayne is um, seeing his old friend Rachel, and they were used to be friends as kids. He's grown up. He disappeared for a while, and now he's kind of living um, this playboy life in the public to kind of hide the work he's doing as Batman. And at one point, he runs into Rachel, and she sees him, and she's super excited, but she sees him doing all this stuff. He's running around, and, and at one point, Bruce looks at Rachel and says, Rachel, I mean, this, this isn't really me. Like, there's, there's something more here. And Rachel goes, Bruce, in, deep down inside, you might still be that little boy I used to know, but ultimately, it's what you do that defines you, not who you are deep down. And the, the wake-up call to Bruce in that moment was that he might think of himself as somebody different, but ultimately his actions play out a certain way and say, this is who I am. So he might hold on to this hope that I'm somebody different, but what she saw is, no, this, this appears to be who you really are. This is how, define, how you're defined. And so what that movie was playing with is this contrast that we sometimes feel about who we think we are, how we think of ourselves, and what we actually do. We like to draw a, a distinction between those, and we like to give ourselves passes and think, okay, I'm, I'm fine, but... Sometimes I mess up, but that's not really me. This is somewhere deep deep down there. There's something better. And so what John's going to look at today is, again, establishing last week, we are children of God, brought in by the baptism into Jesus Christ. What does that look like lived out? And I'm going to tell you up front what John's going to say. He's going to actually make the same argument twice. It's kind of cool, um, with two different emphases. But John's point is going to be, Christians, children of God, don't go on sinning. That's, that's the takeaway already. <laughs> John is going to make the case, if you are a child of God, brought into him, believing, you don't continue in sin. He's going to make this argument twice, um, with two different emphases, but that's ultimately what he's after. So right away, John is, is eliminating any sort of distinction. He's going to make the case, your actions have a very clear connection to who you are. You can't just separate them completely. So that's what he's going to be hitting at today. So we're going to be looking at 1 John Chapter 3, starting in verse 4, look at John's caution against Christians who continue in sin. So this is 1 John 3, starting in verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. All right, so right off the bat, a couple things to comment. First off, um, the word practice here, this is just how the English Standard Version translated it. This does not mean you're, like, practicing, like, when you practice golf. Like, oh, I'm getting better at sinning. Like, hole in one. I, like, really nailed it on the head. Oh. Um, yeah, different translations will just say anyone who sins, anyone who does sin. Um, this is more like somebody who practices medicine, right? It's, it's what you do. It's your livelihood. And so John says anyone who makes a practice of sin, anyone who, who does sin, who continues on the sin, makes that their life, is practicing lawlessness. So right off the bat, John is defining sin. Sin is a word that we use a lot in the church, and sometimes um, we don't have much of a meaning behind it. We just throw it around. Um, Especially to the world, it can come across as just this harsh term that we throw on anything we don't like. Like, that's sin. That's sin. And so uh, right off the bat, John is defining what sin is for us. It is ultimately a lack of God's law. It is lawlessness. Now, sometimes we think of um, God's law, right? And we think of, first and foremost, like the clearest example of God's law is the Ten Commandments, right? Honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Don't steal. And so sometimes we hear the word law and we think of it as as a bad thing. Uh, But laws are actually meant to be for our good. I am very grateful that we have traffic laws. (laughs) Just imagine if you just had a road and there was no law, no rhyme or reason, and everyone just had to go. I can drive on the left. I can drive on the right, right? Laws are meant to make sure things go well. And God ultimately has built in these laws into the world for the world's blessing, Things go better when people don't steal from one another. Things go better when people don't murder one another, right? When people honor their parents and those in authority, when they, when they listen to God and worship him. Um, the law, God's law is ultimately this good, wonderful thing that is for 
human's blessing, for the flourishing and the blessing of all of creation. And so right off the bat, John is saying anyone who, who makes a practice of sinning is ultimately just going against God's law. All of these good things that God has set up for our benefit, we're going against it. We're just doing our own thing. We're being lawless. He continues on here, and this is um, his next move. Is he's talking about what Jesus did. He says, you know that he, that is Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins. And in him, there is no sin. So first, anyone who practices sin is practicing lawlessness. You know Jesus appeared in order to take away sin. So that very thing you're partaking in, you're continuing in, you're doing, um, that's what Jesus came to take away, right? If, you, if we're going to follow Jesus, you realize he didn't want this here. He came to defeat it, and in him there is no sin. This is very reminiscent of the start of John's gospel when John the Baptist sees Jesus and just announces to his disciples, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus is the one who came to take away sin because in him there was no sin. Jesus is the one who lived perfectly in accordance to God's will. Right? It's not just, laws are not just don't cross this line, but rather do, be in alignment with God. And Jesus was the one who embodied that and he came to take away all sin from mankind. John continues in verse 6, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. All right, this is where the language gets really strong. <laughs> so John makes the claim here, nobody who abides in Jesus, who dwells in him, who hears his word, lives by his word, believes in him, keeps on sinning. Just, that's what he says. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. So John, again, this is, he's not pulling punches here. He's saying, it, for one to just keep on sinning, he's like, well, it would appear you haven't even known Jesus. Now, here's where I'm going to just pause, because, again, John's language is, is serious, because he sees a serious problem. He sees Christians who are going about their lives, sinning, continuing it, reveling in it, this is great because I'm forgiven, and he's saying, this is serious business, so knock it off. So we have to hear the full weight of what John's saying. But we also can't lose John's whole letter because in a previous sermon we talked about John himself said, if anyone says that they are without sin, <laughs> they're a liar and the truth is not in them. So this is not to say that once you are saved, once you believe in Jesus, every sin in your life is just gone, vanish, right? That's a very easy temptation because you read a passage like this and it, it feels like that's the takeaway, right? If I sin, oh, do I really believe? Am I really a follower? And so we have to hear the rest of John's letter to remind ourselves that John knows that we are going to sin. And so John is getting at something very different here. There's this idea of continual sin, this um, continuation, this ongoing practice. And so as Christians, even saved by Jesus, um, we have kind of two natures. We have what the Bible calls a new Adam, a new spirit in us. But in this fallen world, we still have this old Adam too. And they're, they're constantly at war with one another. And there's this part of us that will continue to fall into sin. And yet, we, what John's cautioning against is allowing that part of us to win. To just be content with, you know what, I don't mind if I just go on sinning. Um, Paul actually has to fight back against this at one point. Because he's talking about how, you know, when there's sin, there's grace by God. And he says, he, he knows a natural reaction is going to be, should we sin more? So grace may abound, like... Look, if I just do all sorts of terrible stuff, I can rejoice in how good God is. Because look at he forgave this bad of stuff, so why not make it worse? Because I can show how good he is. And Paul says, by no means. And John doesn't want that either. And so he has these very, this very strong language. If you abide in Jesus, you don't keep on sinning. You're not content just living a life of sin. And if you keep on sinning, if you're just content that way, then there's reason for John to question whether you've seen or even know Jesus. Harsh language, but meant to make a point. We can't just be content living according to our own will apart from what God wants. So then John finishes this first section by saying, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. So again, this is, this is a reminder that John's letter is one of care. Um, he's calling his here little children, Right? He's not saying, like, you sinful buffoons, you know. Little children, don't, don't be deceived. So here we, we clearly see that there's some influences around this Christian community that are telling them, you're forgiven, you're good, so you know what? It doesn't really matter what you do. This life doesn't matter. 
you got heaven, it's fine, live it up, enjoy. And John says, don't let anyone deceive you. Rather, whoever practices righteousness, whoever practices living according to God's will, hearing his word, living by it, they are righteous as he is righteous, right? Because they belong to Jesus. So John's going to say the same thing twice. First thing he's, he's emphasizing, though, is that sin opposes God's good law. Like right off the bat, he wants people to see, if this is the God you follow, his law is good. It is for your good and it is for the good of others. And so to sin and to just blatantly ignore it and to do your own thing is to oppose the good thing that God has set up and to just be lawless, a rebel, anarchy. And he doesn't want that. So first and foremost, sin opposes God's good law. Next, he's going to make the same general flow. He's going to talk about why you shouldn't practice um, sin, what Jesus did about it, and then kind of the takeaway from that. And so he's going to now make a different emphasis, um, one that I think is actually more serious than the last one, which we're like, geez, that was pretty intense. So here's what John says next. He says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. (laughs) Read that again. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Sometimes we like to minimize what we've done, and we, and we do this for other people too, we minimize what they've done, but um, we don't always like to call sin what it is. When I hurt somebody, when I sin against somebody, I like to call it a mistake, <laughs> a slip up. I'm not perfect. And those are true. But John says, anyone who makes a practice of sinning, that's the work of the devil. Sometimes we, we lighten the bearing of what sin is, uh, we, we don't like how heavy that is. It, again, that word feels extreme to us. And so um, unless it's something really, really bad, we don't like to call it sin. Because it, it feels, ooh, like, I don't know, I just, I just made a mistake. I, I know I shouldn't have passed along that rumor. Um, but it was just a, little, just a little thing. And so we lighten the language around it. John, on the other hand, takes it deeper. Instead of just calling it sin, he calls it the work of the devil. And he says that the reason we know this is because ultimately the devil is the one who's been sinning from the beginning. We're not going to do a full exploration of the devil today. What we do know is that the devil, or Satan, is this angel, one of God's great angels who fell, who rebelled against God. And ultimately, when you talk about sin being opposed to God's law, he was the ultimate picture of this. Being an angel with God, doing God, a messenger from God, turns his back on him, tries to rebel, and now promotes sinning, promotes Um, turning from God promotes unbelief in the one true God and his son Jesus. And so anyone who makes a practice of sinning, anyone who's just comfortable going about sinning, whatever, John says they're of the devil because that's the devil's, that's his MO. That's his defining feature. The devil's been sinning since the very beginning of time. So if you're going to partake in that, then you're one of his. The reason the son of God appeared, this is again, he, he kind of repeats the same logical progression, was to destroy the works of the devil. You follow this Jesus? He came to defeat the devil was like one of the big things, triumph. I might have mentioned this before, but when we do the Apostles' Creed, um, when we say he descended into hell, um, we actually, the Christian church has always held, that's a victory lap. <laughs> it's, he, he is buried, and then he goes to hell to pronounce victory to the captives. You know what, devil? You lost. I did it. And so that's whole Jesus came to defeat the devil, and so to just partake in his work of sinning and going on, living however we might want to, John's concerned about this, and so he's going to actually then double down on this again. He says, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And in the next verse he says this, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So he says, you're of the devil, <laughs> you can do the work of the devil. And now he says, if you're going to go on living a certain way, you might as well be children of the devil. So again, we're talking about being children of God, and John sets up a strong contrast. There's two categories in John's mind here. Notice this, there's only two, it's a binary. Children of God, children of the devil. That's what John's setting up here. Now it's interesting, because in John's gospel, he has one spot where he talks about being children of the devil. It's this part where he's talking to many of the, the religious leaders of the day, And he has that that one quote that we all love. Um, It's so good. Um, The truth will set you free, right? And then the people 
or respond like, wait, set you free. We're not slaves. Like, we're children of Abraham. We're God's chosen people. And he says, whoever sins is a slave to sin. And then they say, how could we be a slave to sin? We have, we have, God, we have Abraham as our father. And then they go so far to say, we even have God as our father. And then Jesus says, if you had God as your father, you would receive me. But because you don't, you are children of the devil. And what's interesting in that passage is you have this group of people who they claim, right, Abraham is their father. That is a claim to say, you know what, we have the label, we are part of the heritage of Abraham, right? We are God's chosen people. We're good. <laughs> Jesus says, no, you're not. And the equivalent today is when sometimes we're, we're lulled into thinking like, I'm Christian, so I'm good, right? And we do this for other people too, but just like, Christian, good person, I'm fine, good. And so we just use, use that label as a pass for anything. Ah, shoot, I did something pretty bad. But I'm Christian, so I'm good. And John is cautioning because he says, anyone, if you want to know who's the children of God, those who follow Jesus, who practice righteousness, those who are children of the devil, those who do not practice righteousness. It's intense language. It's strong. But John has concerns. And so if the first thing John made the point of, going through this progression once, is that sin is opposed to God's good law. The second is that sin is of the devil. And again, this feels intense. We don't like the heaviness. We don't, I, I don't like the heaviness. It feels, geez, that's pretty extreme. John says, yeah, it is. This, is, this means something. And so John's section here is just, I told you from the beginning, Christians don't keep on sinning, right? And one of the hard things about this kind of continual sin uh, is that sometimes we kind of lull ourselves into ignoring it. Like if I have a, like a hip injury, okay? I hurt something in my hip. Sometimes it needs a procedure to, to heal, right? It can't fix it on its own. And, and I might walk with a limp for a while and it's painful when I step. But if I just kind of go day after day, I just kind of keep going, like I kind of get used to it, kind of learn to compensate for the, the, the limp and, you know, the pain, it kind of subsides and I don't notice it as much. And you can go your whole life with this, this bum hip, right? Not because you fixed it, but because we just kind of got content, we can become numb. And I, and I know in my own life, and maybe you have these things too, where there's maybe some sort of sin you have where at first you're like, I feel terrible about this, right? Maybe you did something, and maybe this is a, a, a repeated pattern of something, and you feel terrible. But after a while, you don't do anything about it. You don't confess it to anyone. You don't take steps to, to give it to God and to ask for his healing. You're kind of like, you know what? I'm kind of learning to function with it. Right? Nobody seems to notice or care, and I seem to be getting by just fine. And, and slowly after time, we kind of be num become numb to our own sin. Right? When we become Christian, and especially when, when something pops up, sin is this glaring, uncomfortable thing. I do not want to live opposed to God. But if we do it long enough, it seems to just kind of mellow out. I don't really notice it anymore. And so all of a sudden you look back, and you have this, this thing that should have been dealt with that is opposed to what God wants for your life, and you've been doing it for months or weeks or, or years. And at this point, you know, you don't even notice. It just becomes a habit. It is really easy to have, to have sins that are these secrets. That maybe because of, of fear or shame, we just kind of hide away. And, and for a while we felt terrible about it, but now we're kind of like, you know what, it's, it's fine, right? So we just keep on going. I think about sometimes with our own money, um, right? So God calls us to use our money well. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, I really feel like God's calling us to um, give to those in need. I really feel like God's calling me to, to give to him and his church. And, and you feel that tug, but then you don't do anything for a little bit. Like, oh, I'll revisit it down the road. And then weeks and months and years pass and it never gets revisited. And pretty soon you're just kind of content where you're at. I think of um, times when we have somebody who God calls us to forgive and the pain is so intense that we just kind of block it out and, you know, I, I, I'm not ready right now, but then pretty soon not ready right now becomes not ready ever. And we just become content with this severed relationship um, because we just kind of feel fine with it. You know, I, I've kind of endured the, the painful part where I knew I should do something and now I'm kind of just fine. And so John's reading today is a wake-up call. <laughs> if there is something that we've been we've become content with, if there's some sort of sin against God's will, 
that we know is, is wrong. This is not how God wants us to live. If we've just been sitting with this and going on continuing it, it's time to confess. It's time to come to God and ask for his forgiveness. It's time to go get help. It's time to come alongside um, the church and say, how can I live and step according to his will? Because I don't want this to be a, a walk that doesn't bear witness to what God has done for me. Because sin is lawlessness, it's of the devil. Jesus came to take away sin, to defeat the works of the devil. And so as Christians, we don't keep on sinning. Now, again, we're going to sin. Sins are going to happen. But just the, the comfortableness that we become sometimes, it's dangerous. Right? Sometimes it's just a little bit of a, a wandering that can then just take us farther and farther from God. If we don't care about walking alongside his will for a little bit, then over time you can drift further and further. And so John is very serious, right? Those things that we are comfortable with, those things in the shadows, those things that are hidden, do something about it. Go to God. Ask for his forgiveness. Ask for a change. Take the steps necessary. And, and when we do this, and if, if you're like me, any serious reflection, you start going through the things, and it just breaks you. Right? Again, one of the things we do to kind of protect our self-esteem is that we, we lighten the language, Instead of using the word sin, sometimes we just call it mistakes. We call it a little slip up. But when we take them for the full weight of what they are as a, as, as a rebellion against what God wants, as a participation in what the devil wants of us, it's intense. And yet John does not leave us without promise. Because if we were to just read this, we would have to confess, as the Bible says, Oh Lord, who can stand? <laughs> If this is the bar, then none of us are going to reach it. We're not going to get close. We can pretend all we want. And yet John reminds us that ultimately when we're thinking about who we are, it isn't just our actions that define us. This is where Rachel was wrong. John reminds us, this was earlier in this letter. John writes, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. When we come to Jesus, and we just lay it all out there, Jesus, I have sinned in ways far worse than I can even comprehend. Right? Jesus says, it's okay. Don't worry about what you've done, but think about what I've done. Because Jesus came, right? What did John say? To take away sin. He came to people who were seeping in sin and people who were very aware of their sin and, and forlorn and despondent and everything inside of them and everything the world was telling them was saying, you are filthy, you are sinful, you are the devil, you have no place in God's presence. And Jesus said, let me take God's presence and bring it to you. Let me sit with you. And he is our advocate now because he is the one who lived according to God's will, who did everything as God desired and we're sometimes those, those sins that we allow to kind of hang around, right? We, we think we're going to address them, but we kind of, we hesitate, we wait on it. When it came to saving you, Jesus had no hesitation. There was no, oh, you know, I'll get around to forgiving. I'll get around to saving. He plunged into the sinful world, pure and holy, and redeemed it. Redeemed you and me. He walked according to God's will, and he took on the devil, and his temptations, and then finally on that cross, and he rose victorious so that all who believe in him might know that this Jesus is their advocate. That when we sin and we come to God and we know that we are not worthy of anything, Jesus says, on my account, they're worthy to be called children of God. They're worthy of being called righteous like God is. And this is one of the, the beauties, like I said, sometimes we, we lighten the impact of the language, right? When we allow sin to be all that sin is, we allow our Savior to be all that he is. He didn't come to fix a few mistakes. He came to save people who on their own cannot live as God wants, who on our own are just going to wander the way of the devil. And he came to course correct and to grab us off the ground and to say, no, 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 come with me, you are mine. And so as Christians, we get to just put it all out there. We get to confess to God, hold nothing back, right? 
Because he's seen it all. He knows it all. And so we can take those things that are done in the shadows, those things that we hide, and just confess it to God. And, and confess it to, this is again, I'll, I'll put a plug. If, if there's everything on, anything on your conscience, I am here as a pastor to remind you of this, to hear confessions. We have brothers and sisters in the faith to walk alongside. We don't do this on our own. We walk as a family, as fellow brothers and sisters. We walk as people who are forgiven and who are righteous because of Jesus. Sin, terrible. It's not good. Jesus, far greater, far more loving. And while we might continue to sin, while well, times that old part of us, that old Adam, that sinful nature is going to creep up here and there, we have a Savior whose love continues to pour over and over and over. Every time we come to him, there isn't a question. The only words are, you are forgiven. So ultimately, right, Bruce and Rachel's exchange, defined by who you are deep down, are you defined by what you do? You're defined by what Jesus has done. By his death and resurrection, you are his children. And so now we are called to live as children. Live as children who do not go on sinning, but to confess, to rejoice in the forgiveness he has given. The victory that we haven't won, but that he's won for us. May that be our joy. Amen.